Ross Cook. Uh, like Don had mentioned, I'm the Director of Sales for Large Case and National Accounts for Western Canada. Uh, two strategies I want to talk about uh, with the group this morning, but first, uh, just a brief introduction uh, with who's on the call. Uh, I will be the main presenter today in terms of going through all the material, uh, but I'm not going to be monitoring the chat. I would highly encourage you to ask questions along the way. Uh, we're lucky enough to be joined by our dedicated tax lawyer, uh, Pierre Philippe, who will be working the chat for today's presentation. I'm going to share a little bit more about the work Pierre Philippe and his teammates do for us at IA. Uh, we are making a lot of noise in the large case support space. It's an area where our brokers have been asking for a really long time. Uh, what we were hearing was, you know, your products, pricing, process are all great, but we could really use some head office support when it comes to the large case market. And we've dedicated a lot of resources to building out that team over the last 12, even in the last six months, I'd say there's been even more changes and so continues to evolve. And we're excited to share that with you. Uh, really quick housekeeping notes. We are coming live from across Canada. This webinar is being recorded and you will get a copy of the material once we are finished. And so I uh, just, if that's a question that you had, I'm hoping I can answer that for you. CE credits are being offered. The only disclaimer that I have is uh, for the folks on the call from Alberta, uh, getting credit hours in Alberta is a little trickier to get them authorized. We've applied for and are expecting uh, one CE credit for all across Canada, including Alberta, uh, but the AIC credits are pending. Uh, before we hop into the agenda, just more on the theme of housekeeping, uh, disclaimer, uh, we strongly recommend that you consult independent professionals and assume no responsibility for the use of the contents of this training material. Uh, we're going to be going through some tax strategies. We do have Pierre Philippe on the call to answer any questions. Uh, that being said, every client situation is different. And so we would recommend, you know, having them meet with their own tax advisors. And in some cases, that might actually result in more business for you because uh, you'll learn more about the client situation. And so uh, just make sure that these are not necessarily mass market materials. They're more niche to specific markets. And we'll give that framework and context uh, to the group as well today. In terms of an agenda, uh, this is not related specifically to insurance, but I, I think it's related. And that's a quote that I love. It's that people don't buy products or services. They buy your solution to their problems. And I think that's so key when you think of what we do as financial advisors. And so what I wanted to do today is identify a couple of problems that are facing high net worth clients in Canada and business owner clients in Canada. So here's some of the problems that, that we know these clients have or presumably they will have. And then come back with two different strategies that can help to solve these problems. One is a life insurance strategy. The other is a living benefit strategy. A really fun part for me is I'm going to get to show off some new tools that we have at IA uh, including custom client presentations. And so a lot of my material is actually available for you to use to present to your specific clients. And so uh, really happy to be here. And I'm going to jump right in here uh, and get started on high net worth clients. Now, I love this slide, uh, mainly to set framework and context for who should be looking at these types of strategies uh, but at the same time, I think it's a really important to get over certain mental blocks that might exist when considering going after clients in this market. And that is there's clients who need insurance, basic protection need. And that's what's talked about a lot in the marketplace. Think people that are concerned about dying too soon and needing to pay off debts and needing to replace future income. There's also clients, though, that they have enough capital. They don't necessarily need life insurance, but they might want to use some in that if they passed away with their current net worth, their family is going to be okay. It's just they're not going to be as tax efficient as they could have been had they used life insurance. And so it's important, you know, there's a difference between someone who needs life insurance and someone who uses life insurance. I have advisors that use this framework when they talk to a client who says, I don't need life insurance. 
Well, you may want to use some, you, you may want some, you might not need it, but you might use it. And that's a different conversation. So one of the areas where clients could look at using some life insurance, and that's predominantly where we're going to focus today. I'm not going to get too much into the needs base, which would be more like going through a needs analysis and mortgage replacement, that kind of stuff. We're talking more from an estate planning need today. And uh, there has never been a better time to be a financial advisor in Canada. This is the first time of two times I'm going to say that in this presentation. The largest wealth transfer in Canadian history is taking place right now. There's a trillion dollars that's going to transfer between 2016 and 2026. And in preparing for this presentation, our head office had compiled a list of concerns uh, that affluent Canadians have. So clients that are passing down money, their, their concerns are they're concerned how their heirs will handle the money. They're concerned that their child won't have the financial literacy to manage a windfall. And they're concerned that their child won't pass anything down to their grandchildren. With all three of these concerns, life insurance can have a real impact. What's interesting from an opportunity perspective on the advisor side is we did a little bit of research around uh, whether or not your client's children plan to keep their existing financial advisor. Now, this is not a survey of advisors on the call. This is mass market, so I'm not meaning this to be a targeted attack. Uh, but just in the chat, just out of curiosity, what percentage of financial advisors do you think have met their client's children? What percentage do you think? You can, you can throw any number out there. If you were to guess what percentage of advisors meet with their client's children, I would throw in grandchildren. So I'm seeing 5%, 18%. You're right on, right on the right track. The number we found was 25%. That was a large survey done by MFS Investment Management. I believe they were down in the States. Uh, the scarier number to me was what percentage of children plan to keep the parent's financial advisor after receiving an inheritance. This was done by Price Waterhouse Cooper, and that's 2%. And so you can see the opportunity there that lies in one, insurance being a phenomenal vehicle for transferring wealth, but two, an opportunity to meet your client's children. The assets are going to roll to them. It's better to start that relationship now, even if it's not cash flow positive. Meeting a 13-year-old and packing $50 a month, I understand that that's not a fantastic use of your time when it comes to money in, money out. However, being that trusted advisor for the family is worth your time, and it could become a bigger challenge as this asset transfer takes place. So to summarize that, and this is going to come into the theme of a state bond, there's a trillion transferring in the next 10 years. Most of the clients receiving their money are not planning to work with the financial advisor. I see two opportunities here, one being an opportunity to get some new clients, two being an opportunity to reinforce relationships with your existing clients and becoming the trusted advisor for the whole family. Uh, older clients may have estate planning in place, but it's more likely out of date. And so maybe, you know, this is the, the alarm bell that goes off to get you to start talking to your clients about estate planning. If they have estate planning already, has it been updated? The second challenge that high net worth Canadians have is their saving options for retirement. Taxes continue to go up. And there's really three main areas where Canadians will save their money. The first is RRSP. The second is TFSA. And then on top of that, we would have non-registered investments. Now, I don't want to go through uh, for the purposes of this call. I recognize there's some very established advisors on the call. I don't want to go through RRSP, TFSA basics, but just a couple bullet points on all of these sections. RRSPs are fantastic. Uh, but the word is tax deferred, not tax free. And so they work best when your tax rate is going to be lower in retirement when you pull the money out than it is today. At the same time, still a fantastic vehicle that your clients should absolutely look at. Uh, they will roll over to your spouse on a tax free basis, uh, but withdrawals are taxable as income. TFSA, tax free growth, small limits, and withdrawals are tax free. Uh, really, the only key issue with TFSA is that the, um, the limits are just low. If the limits were higher, this would be an even better financial product than it already is. Uh, another just sales opportunity. 
Uh, these are accounts that a lot of advisors have forgotten about over the years and let clients deal with their banks. And they're starting to get pretty significant. We're up to around 80,000, uh, depending on how their investments had done and contributing an additional six grand a year. Uh, really important. And last is non-registered. And this is the area where we could look to reposition some non-registered assets into an insurance contract. That's what I am going to illustrate for the group today. Uh, any investment growth is taxable. I understand it's taxable in different ways, either along the way or on death or on redemption, but there will be tax payable on a non-registered investment. Uh, they will roll over to your spouse tax-free, uh, but they are taxable on second death. Now, I have to give a huge shout out to Pierre Philippe, who's on the call, who put this together for me. Uh, in terms of the RRSP, if you had maxed all your RRSP every single year since 1992, you would end up with $67,000 a year of taxable income. How did we get that number? Well, we took the max RRSP contribution possible, assumed a 6% interest rate, and then did a quote for an annuity uh, at, I wasn't sure what the age was there, but at after 20, 30 years it was. Uh, that's not going to be enough income for many of your higher income earning Canadians to retire on. And so that's another challenge that comes with existing options. And so it's not that any particular option is bad. It's just that there may be a way that we can restructure their existing planning and work with it to optimize their financial plan. Uh, summary, TFSA, hey, that's fantastic, but limited room. RSP is taxable as income when you make withdrawals and potentially on death, proper planning is required here. I would suggest the amount of Canadians that understand that RSP withdrawals are taxable in retirement is low. And the percentage of Canadians that understand that it's fully taxable to their children on second death as income is even lower. And so that's something that is not a bad vehicle. It just requires proper planning. And there's tax and estate considerations for non-registered investments. And so in, in summary, there's there's options for Canadians to save money in Canada, but there might be better ways to structure them that'll work better for their own family situations on the personal side. For business owners, and, and this is, I'm going to tell you, this is the second best time to be a financial advisor in Canada. We hear for years that succession and estate planning is boring and nobody's interested in it and nobody wants to talk about it. Well, we talk pandemic and there's, I've seen some presentations and some stats around Canadians seeing you know, COVID on TV every time they turn on. That's not the only thing they're seeing when they turn on their TV. When I turned on my TV over the lockdown, there's a couple things that I saw on the screen that I just looked at and saw succession planning. Uh, I don't know if anyone and in the chat, feel free to comment. Uh, this one was pretty popular over lockdown. Yellowstone, the most popular TV show in North America, I would say, uh, you know, they wouldn't even have a TV show if John Dutton had a proper estate plan. No spoilers, I promise. But if he had a proper estate plan, uh, they wouldn't even be worried. Ozarks, another show that we got watching my wife and I over the lockdown. Uh, Marty is a financial planner. Now, I don't have any strategies that will help with his particular set of circumstances. If you do watch that show, uh, you'll understand what I mean. But uh, again, financial advisor, succession planning, and last the title of the show is Succession. These are things that Canadians are watching in their free time and find interesting. We want to make sure that your family members aren't looking at each other at the kitchen table like these siblings are, right? We want to get a succession plan in place. So a tax challenge from a business owner and, and succession planning is a little bit different than an employee. And that is every single day is a risk as a business owner, both in your ability to earn an income being stopped by an illness or injury, or by items that are outside of your control as well. You know, maybe you have a new competitor store open across the street. Every day is a risk. Tax planning and income planning work a little bit differently when you're a business owner. Do I pay myself salary? Do I pay myself dividends? Do I need to optimize and make sure I'm qualifying for the lifetime capital gains exemption? There's a lot more considerations. And last is succession planning. The average Canadian just has to worry about retiring. Business owners care about who takes over their business and they want to ensure it continues to be successful even after they retire. The second part of that is most business owners these days are not retiring, they're just slowing down. 
And so they're bringing in someone else, but maybe working a little bit as well. And uh, I think succession planning is something that they're happy to talk about. The only challenge with talking is that if they've never been disturbed before and never looked at in a succession planning, if no one's ever asked them those questions, it, it can be a lot to unwind, but at the same time, it will present a lot of opportunity. Uh, the next challenge that a business owner has uh, is, is good and bad, and it just prevent, presents unique planning opportunities. So in terms of tax rates, uh, they have to worry about their their corporate and their personal tax rate. I have every province up on the screen. I will be sharing this after the call, but I'm just going to uh, round those up. And what the business owner is going to deal with is every dollar I earn in my business and keep in my business, I get taxed 15%. So I get taxed, I get to keep 85 cents of every dollar I earn in my business. The challenge I have is when I go to pay that into my personal name, I have to pay 50% tax. And so I'm left with 50 cent dollars instead of 85 cent dollars. Now, there's a lot of assumptions going on in this slide. I just wanted just a quick graphic that what starts to happen is business owners start to build some wealth inside of their corporation. The challenge with that is that at some point, either while you're alive or sell the business or perhaps exit the business due to an illness or a death, CRA is going to deem that you sold your business and that is going to become taxable as income at some point. So what a lot of clients will do is they'll start to save money with and invest within their corporations. Some challenges with that is that investment gains are taxed at roughly 50%. If you open an investment account inside your corporation, there are different strategies out there. I can appreciate that that 50% is not going to work for every single scenario out there. Uh, but they're not taxed efficiently. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, passive investment rules start at $50,000 a year. What does that mean? Well, if you start to earn more than $50,000 a year in investment income inside of your corporation, you'll actually start to lose your small business deduction, leading to a lot more tax. And last, and I, I recognize that there's different mechanisms within the Income Tax Act that will help with this. At the same time, though, once you cash out your corporate investments and sell out of a position, the money's still all in your corporation. And you go back to the same scenario we were sort of in in slide one, where you have money in a corporation that has to get to your personal name and that has to go through and be taxed appropriately. Uh, there are some, you know, with whether it's an eligible or an ineligible dividend, we're not going to go down that road of taxation today. But just know that it, it, it does create a challenge. So in summary, for business owners, every day is a risk. There's opportunities for tax and income planning while alive that they need to look into and they likely already look at with their accountants. And succession planning is a conversation that is a lot easier to have while you're still in a position to see the plan through. Now, as financial advisors, these are three areas that we can really help with with our clients. The next with high net worth summary, I know I went through kind of two main opportunities there, two main problems that we can help. I'm, I'm going to just focus those in on three. One is there's a large amount of wealth transferring right now from one generation to another, and life insurance planning can help there. Registered accounts are a fantastic place to start. They may not be enough to meet retirement goals for Canadians. And there's also tax considerations when it comes specifically to the RRSP. And the last, non-registered investment growth is taxable. I would say this is true for both corporate and personally held investments. Non-registered accounts are something that present a pretty good opportunity for reallocation and, and repositioning some of their money into a life insurance uh, policy. Now, I'm going to share one more quote here before we move into the actual cases and the meat and potatoes uh, but before I do, I just want to see if there's any questions from the group in terms of framing the conversation, uh, some challenges that Canadians are currently facing, both as high net worth and business owner clients. Any, any questions from the group in the chat? I didn't see any there. I see a couple of guesses at my slide. Uh, how much is considered as high net worth? Uh, great question, Vicky. 
Um, I would consider someone high net worth that's maxed out all their registered investments. I would also consider someone higher net worth that's potentially in the highest tax bracket, highest marginal tax rate in their in their uh, pr- particular province. And that can range from 48% to 53.5% tax as a marginal tax rate. Uh, so I'd say someone who has maxed out all their uh, registered account room, RSP, NTFSA, and still saving and earning a good income. I hope that answers your question. It really is case by case. Uh, but that's what I would consider high net worth. This next quote is from Ben Feldman, who is, and there's there may be someone on the call who have seen, um, who have seen this before. Uh, don't sell life insurance, sell what life insurance can do. So I, I started the presentation off by saying, you know, we want to look into uh, solving problems, right? People buy solutions to problems. So I have two strategies that can help uh, with these problems that I've identified here. I just saw one more chat come in. Um, 10% then, uh, you know, Nikhil, I'm very sorry. I don't know what you're referencing. Um, so if you want to take that up offline, I'm sorry, I just saw 10%, but I'm not sure what that was related to. Um, so two strategies we're going to present on today to help with those problems I've identified. Strategy one is a state bond slash using life insurance as an asset class. And what we're going to do is increase your client's net worth. We're going to make sure all their family members are treated fairly. Think back to the wealth transfer happening. And last, we're going to fund the entire plan by repositioning your existing investments I saw Brad on the call here, and I love your expression, Brad. If I take a $20 bill out of my right pocket and move it into my left pocket, do I still own the $20 bill? We're going to reposition their existing investments into an insurance contract, and that's going to increase their net worth and make sure all the family members. I saw a question in the chat. We will get there. I I just don't want to get too far ahead. So just hang on for a couple minutes. Uh, We will get back to you on that one. The second strategy I'm going to look at is shared ownership CI. And that's going to provide a lump sum tax-free cash to your corp if you get diagnosed with a critical illness. We mentioned as a business owner, one of their concerns is every day is at risk. Uh, We can pay for the premium with after-tax corporate dollars. So you can spend some of that corporate surplus. But you do need to pay for the ROP rider with after-tax personal dollars. The benefit in doing that If you stay healthy, you could receive all your premiums back personally and tax-free. There are more things to come with that strategy. This is just meant to be a positioning slide. This is not my whole presentation, I promise. Uh, We're going to start with that life insurance as an asset class. This is more to the what is the uh, high net worth Canadian. And I put this together because I would not consider these people ultra high net worth, right? but they're earning a good income and they're saving more than they spent. So meet Phil and Tammy. Uh, They're making 150 grand a year. Uh, Both non-smokers, both have a full pension, maxed out their RSP and TFSA, which is very common, by the way, with clients who have pensions is that their pension room gets, RSP room gets impacted by the uh, pension adjustments, no debts and uh, 200,000 in non-registered savings. So they do have Uh, Very significant assets, but they're not multi, multi multi-millionaires. When I say high net worth, that's not what what I'm getting at. Their income's $12,500 a month. Their retirement income is going to be $10,000 a month. And their household expenses are $8,000 a month. So again, they're going to be okay and they're going to save more than they spend. They're going to die with money. That's what's going to happen to these clients. And if by doing that, they're going to have... Uh, some unnecessary taxes. So what if we looked at doing this another way? We're going to reposition 20,000 a year from a mix of a couple places. One, uh, their non-registered assets and two, their existing savings. They were saving into their non-reg. We're going to shut that tap off. We're going to fund this par contract. We can fund it by repositioning existing savings and drawing down non-registered. Uh, 20 pay with max ADO offset at year 10. The 20 pay matches well, and I've gone with that 
uh, max ADO. It just provides them some extra flexibility in terms of premium payments and gives them the ability to pay past year 10 if they wanted to. So how does that compare to their existing planning? I saw a question about repositioning the assets. Uh, this portion of the presentation will kind of speak to that. Existing portfolio, they've got uh, RRSP and TFSA and non-reg. That's what they're currently doing. And I've got a new way to structure the portfolio where we're going to move in a chunk of life insurance. And so what we're going to do is reposition their existing non-registered assets into an insurance contract. And by doing so, uh, you end up with a really attractive way to diversify their account, but also have a really attractive net return to the estate. For example, at age 90, uh, the equivalent return on your investments would be 11.18%. Now, this is something that we can make custom for clients in the large case market, completely customized to their own specifications. The other thing we can do, if we look at their existing portfolio, and I have this listed as a balanced portfolio, uh, it'll show the projected returns. These returns are based on FP Canada assumptions. I can also change these to customize the client's existing holdings. And so uh, we can really customize this presentation. And then we move in a chunk of life insurance. And what does that do for your client? At age 85, 90, and 95, we're using a joint last to die policy here. And so again, just fantastic stuff. But how does that compare? Why are we doing this? Well, they're going to invest $400,000 total into this plan. And if they did that in any other type of investment, where do they end up at age 90? Uh, because keep in mind, this is money they're likely not going to spend, right? This is money that's going to get passed down to the next generation. So if you look at the gross return, it actually outperforms a portfolio that is 100% equity. Uh, it outperforms their existing investments uh, by a, over half a million dollars, and it outperforms fixed income significantly, but where insurance makes the biggest impact is the tax. Now we're dealing with a personal scenario here. And so the tax considerations are fewer. It's all personal money. We don't have to worry about the ACB, but you can see that that equity piece, the returns get chewed away at by income tax. And that wouldn't be the case with the lump sum tax-free death benefit. Now, one of the concerns that clients may have with a strategy like this is, can I access the money along the way? And you absolutely can. Uh, Don, you mentioned at the start, we're going to touch on insured retirement strategy. We could present on this strategy uh, the full hour. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to touch on this particular scenario. These clients could take their policy at age 72, which I've chosen on purpose. That's going to match with uh, perhaps some RIF conversions. It's a really popular age to start looking at, at this and take the cash value at that point would be $835,000 and collaterally assign it to the bank. And they would give you a loan of $50,000 a year from age 72 to 82. And that loan would not have any tax deducted. That'd be a tax-free loan advance from a third-party lender. At death, the insurance policy would pay off the loan and your estate would be left with $500,000. Now, in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on this very briefly. There's a lot of moving parts there that I would be happy to present on on a future session. Just know that the life insurance cash value can be used to optimize their retirement income. And some scenarios we're proposing, and this is a slide I like the best, and I think this is probably the most likely scenario for Phil and Tammy. If they go through with the planning and they never touch the money, they're going to leave $1.5 million to their estate. Alternatively, in retirement years, they can take loans of $50,000 a year against the contract from age 72 to 82 and leave their estate with $500,000. So it's a fantastic way to position to a client. Look, you can use a retirement income planning if you want. You don't have to use the insured retirement plan though. You can just keep the money in the insurance contract. It'll continue to buy paid up additions. It'll continue to grow 
a tax-free benefit for your children to enjoy. And so that is the insured retirement strategy mixed in with a state bond. The second strategy I wanted to chat through with you is critical illness. Now I mentioned for business owners, and this is a business owner specific strategy, their concerns were tax liability at death, tax and income planning while alive. And then I have down here, the business couldn't function if they are sick or if they are hurt. Uh, this is a strategy that will help in those scenarios. I do need some help from the audience here. If you don't mind in the chat, I promise I'm not going to make anyone come off camera. No singing, dancing, talking. I just a quick, and there's no wrong answer to this question. What are some reasons a business owner should have critical illness coverage? What are some risks it would protect them from? What are some things he could use the money for? Any questions on that? Any potential risks that a key person, Andrew, you absolutely nailed it. That's a fantastic reason to buy a CI. Uh, some that have kind of come up through giving this presentation multiple times around CI. Uh, you mentioned key person, the ability to access private health care, uh, preserve value of RRSP. Tis the season, Ravinder, right? RRSP deadline today. Uh, pay for professional to step in, key person. Jeff absolutely nailed, nailed it. In reality, what critical illness insurance is, it's a lump sum of tax-free cash at a time when you need it the most. And that's as simple as it needs to be. You can use the money for whatever you want. In this case, it would be owned by the corporation. And so it'd be the business would receive the benefit. Now, implementing a shared ownership strategy, uh, there's three steps to that that are critically important. Uh, first, your client needs to get CI coverage financially and medically underwritten. On the financial side, we can do up to 2.5 million as our max face amount for critical illness. They would need to go through appropriate medicals to get the coverage, but same as any insurance. The other two steps in this process are gonna take place outside of IA Financial. We do have some tools to help you, uh, but we can't do them for you. The first is drafting a legal agreement. We do not have a legal agreement that you can use with your clients. We do have a step-by-step -step guide for you to give your client to take to their own lawyer to have it drafted. Second, an accountant needs to allocate income appropriately and, doc appropriately and document annually, meaning for the shareholders portion of the premium, it's really important that the client documents it on an annual basis. It is not going to be documented on our side. We do not offer direct billing for the shareholders portion of the premium. Uh, you would need to have the client and the accountant meet and add that income on on a case by case basis annually. And I'd suggest documenting it so that if you are in an audit position, you're able to provide them appropriate material to show the agreement existed and that it was split appropriately. I do have a case study, um, a lawyer, 38 year old male, good savings. He pays himself 250,000 a year. So really high income earning uh, young man. Uh, million dollars of gross income. He's the only lawyer on his staff. And so just think of the issue that this client has is that if he becomes critically ill, his business can't function. That million dollars of billables is going to go away. Uh, he also has some retained earnings. So we're going to present to Dan a strategy that if he becomes critically ill, we'll have a million dollars in tax-free money payable to his corporation. Uh, we're structuring it as a T75 with an ROP at age 65. So what are some risks associated with critical illness? We talked about that on the slide previous, but Dan, just know if you have a loss of customers, if you have a loss of income, a loss of spouse's income, we're going to have a million dollars for you. A big objection that you get to CI from clients is they are Superman. They're not going to get sick. Well, I have some really scary statistics here. And that is the likelihood of a critical illness for Dan is one in three. Uh, it also shows survival rates as well. And if we were to compare that to some other types of insurance, you're insured for these other three risks, your house insurance, your car is insured, and you have life insurance. But the most likely event to happen is a critical illness. And that's the one you don't currently have insurance for. 
So what if there's a way we could structure it where we put the appropriate coverage in place, but also give you an, an opportunity to receive some tax-free money out of your corporation? Uh, we call it the Health Savings Program for Executive Management. How does that work? Step by step. Uh, step one, your corporation is going to take out a million dollar insurance policy for critical illness. So if you become sick, the corporation is going to receive a million dollars and that's going to cost $10,620 a year. If you get sick, they receive the benefit. If you pass away, at any point before age 65, the corporation receives 100% of the premiums back. The second step in this process is your corporation is going to generate a taxable benefit equivalent to the cost of the ROP rider, so $3,150 to Dan. And if you stay healthy at age 65, you're going to receive $286,740. So if we were to break that out into an ROI, and this is just on the shareholder portion. So if you took $3,150 and invested it, you need to earn 7.79% on your money to match the ROP. It's a really good return. Alternatively, if you took the entire amount corporately, so we can run the ROI on the entire strategy. I have a bias. I like this calculation, perhaps for an accountant or a very technical client. I'm not so sure I like it in every scenario. And that's because a lot of this money is trapped corporate surplus. So they're not looking to earn a return on it. I also know that we've had accountants say a big thing with shared ownership CI is the opportunity cost on the actual premium. And so if you took the $10,620 a year plus the cost to generate a shareholder benefit and invested it to net $286,000 personally at age 65, you need to earn 2.73% on your money. Keep in mind that's guaranteed as long as the contract stays in force, as long as you don't lapse it. You also had a million dollars in CI coverage all along the way. So a really great strategy here to help accomplish a couple of things that Dan is struggling with. So in summary, business owners have a need for critical illness protection. I would hope we can all agree on that, that a business owner should have CI, even if they have corporate investments and could fund it, it may be more efficient to use the insurance company's money instead. Uh, taxation of corporate versus personal income creates unique planning opportunities and the shared ownership strategy can help with both. Any questions before I move on to just the next section of my presentation, uh, we went through the, you know, estate bond and shared retirement strategy. Now we went through the shared ownership CI again, pretty high level, but I just want to plant some seeds and I'm hoping on the call that Maybe you've jotted down a couple of names of, of clients you think could be a fit for these strategies. I'm not seeing any chat, so I'm going to move along. How can IA Financial help you as an advisor? Uh, first, for clients age 15 under, our non-medical limit is $2 million, and our electronic app will give you a decision right at the point of sale, including an electronic signature and an electronic delivery with electronic contract, leading edge electronic tools. If you haven't tried out Evo already, it'll change your business on both the insurance and the investment side. I'm going to share a personal story on the investment side. Uh, because of who I am as a person, I waited till yesterday to make my RRSP donation. Uh, donation contribution. I used Evo Savings. It took me three minutes and I've never been trained on that platform before. Absolutely incredible. Uh, even with the Evo e application, usually we're not providing training because it's so user friendly. We just have to show you how to start. But once you start, the app does all the work for you. It's absolutely incredible, including a decision at the point of sale, a risk tolerance program. Uh, you may be familiar with some other programs for rate reductions. For clients rated plus 100 or lower, we can give them a shot at a standard offer. Need to be under 70, needs to be under 1 million in total coverage, and we can't go to reinsurance. If those don't happen and it's rated plus 100 or lower, 
we can issue the contract standard. So you could be argue that between our electronic process from start to finish and our risk tolerance program, you're giving your client a really great shot at a standard offer and a smooth process. VIP underwriting for clients with premiums above $5,000. This is huge. So the minimum is five grand. We will review all requirements within 24 hours and give you a direct line to discuss directly with the underwriter on the case. It's something agents have asked for for a long time. Uh, it's a program that gets rave reviews. So we do have VIP underwriting uh, and they do a fantastic, I can't speak highly enough about the team, certainly in Vancouver, which, which I work through. Um, and last, we also have dedicated local and specialized support. So not only do we have wholesalers in every region across Canada, but we also have wholesalers dedicated to a business line. In Atlantic Canada, you have Lawrence and Chris. Uh, Lawrence is pulling double duty with life and living benefits. Uh, and Chris is managing the savings and retirement. For Quebec Atlantic, uh, your contacts are Nelson, Danny, and Mark. Uh, the cover off life insurance, living benefits, and savings retirement. So Danny would cover all things CI and disability. Nelson, all things life insurance. I will be sharing a copy of this presentation with everyone uh, on the call. So if you're racing to write this down, no worries. You'll, you'll have it back to you uh, with appropriate time and you can jot that down and call them. Ontario, uh, we have Al, we have Adela and Angelina. Uh, in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, uh, your contacts are James, Jessica and Joseph. I thought it was really helpful to include a slide with, you know, faces, names, emails, phone numbers. Uh, it's just, it's important to have that relationship with your local wholesaler. Uh, Alberta, your contacts are Danny, Chelsea, and Ian. And in BC, so we've gone right across Canada now, uh, we have Rishu, Venora, and Hilda, uh, who are your dedicated team uh, to helping you with your life insurance, CIDI, and then your SEG fund sales. They're, they're here to help you. Uh, Don mentioned at the start of the call, your one-stop shop for all things large cases is a new department that we've started at IA. Uh, called the AFTS team, uh, the Advanced Financial and Tax Solutions team. Uh, this includes a director of sales in each region as part of that region's team. Meaning if you're in Ontario, you have a dedicated large case support person at IA. Uh, that doesn't mean that your support from Al will be any different. It just means that Al has help now from Rob in the large case market. Al himself is phenomenal in the large case area. We've added to the support teams. We haven't taken anything away. We've added to them, which is fantastic. Uh, Michelle does Quebec and Atlantic, and then I cover the West. So Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC. I get the most frequent flyer miles of anyone on the large case team. Uh, love the territory I work in. Incredibly uh, different group of brokers in every province, which keeps my days very interesting, which I love. Uh, so we do have dedicated large case people in each region. At a head office level, uh, Pierre Lafontaine runs the AFTS team. Uh, we also have a tax lawyer and a tax advisor on the, on the call today, never mind on the call today, on your side. And we have these resources for you when you need them. Your request should still start with your local director. But to know you have a tax lawyer in your corner, the number of times I've had Pierre Philippe help me with advisors, I've lost count. Um, Charles has gotten really involved in a couple of cases on an accounting side, specifically on shared ownership CI. He was telling me a, a client story and, and Pierre Lafontaine's experience is second to none in this marketplace. We are an extension of the team at IDC and an extension of your own personal team as an advisor to know by going with IA that you're going to have access to a tax lawyer is a real value add and it's a huge part of our offering. And I ask you to please take advantage of that offering. Uh, support with client materials. So I did something a little bit sneaky during this presentation. I actually built in marketing material right into uh, my presentation. Uh, for critical illness, 
All of those slides you saw on the shared ownership for uh, Dan, the lawyer, we can actually customize those for your client's scenarios, which is absolutely fantastic to see. Uh, we also have a guide to writing an agreement and we do have marketing material on the shared ownership strategy for CI. We do not uh, not provide that. We're a company that does support it, which I know is not true with every company in Canada. We do support the shared ownership CI strategy. And we're going to give you some tools to help uh, custom client presentation for you to promote and sell this product uh, in a really cool way. Uh, we're also able to give you marketing material and help with drafting the agreement. We don't have a sample. It's a guide. Uh, we didn't do not have a sample. It's a guide of what to include. Uh, for clients to take to their lawyers. Uh, again, custom presentation. Uh, we can do these for a number of strategies. Uh, customized client presentation was used today. Uh, this slide in the middle was a part of my uh, asset class presentation. We can run insurance as an asset class. We now run a plan compare tool. I can compare up to six different permanent insurance products all in one place for you to review. Uh, and we can run custom client material for IFA, corporate and personal insured retirement, life insurance as an asset class, and the one I did today, which is a mix of both. When clients are coming to you, they're not coming to you saying, I want an insured retirement with insurance as an asset class or not. It's you're looking, working with them to say, how can we reposition some of this money in an efficient way to increase your net worth, grow your estate, while also having access to the money along the way to supplement your retirement income. And so the insured retirement strategy asset class piece kind of gets all that work done in one clean place. Uh, from there, I will say thank you for the time. I know I'm about 10 minutes early. Uh, I'm going to take this time to answer any questions that came in through the chat, any questions that you might have, Don, but mainly want to say thanks. Uh, appreciate it. And I will get that presentation off to everyone on the call. Yeah, I would say we have a couple of minutes. So what I noticed that we have is uh, uh, Mark Martin is uh, with us. And he runs the uh, general funds, I guess, the portfolio management general funds. Uh, Martin, are you also running the, you're also running the PAR fund then? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh... And I think it's it's interesting that you mentioned that. I think it's 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 one of the key uh, the key uh, I would say uh, a key point here is that the fact that we're uh, it's very similar in terms of strategy. So basically, the interests are really aligned because what we're doing for the company, we're doing it for the par too. So when we have access to alternative investment for the uh, the, the the general funds, which by the way is about forty five billion, we do take. A portion of those investment and we were able to put them in the par so i think it's a you know even though the par is still uh, small in size and, and it will grow the, the the firepower is the firepower of the entire uh, ia uh, investment management that you have so we have access to great deal because of that and we we're able to allocate them to the par fund so it's it's really the and trust alignment is very important in this in this particular case. So one of the things that's come up, of course, the last few years is that we had such low interest rates, and uh, our bond portfolios and our carrier companies are maturing. They're ten years old, been eleven years, twelve years into this run. What are you doing to shore up in terms of your investment philosophy? What are you doing in terms of shoring up your replacement of those bonds? Because you're not going to get long-term bonds today at any decent rate what how do you manage that portfolio fund to give us a, a decent performance so that our par policies are reflected by that performance well the the key interesting point is the fact that our par fund is so new that we uh, we don't have to uh, to struggle with the fact that we have a I don't know a, a legacy portfolio where bonds are probably yielding ten percent and now you have to reinvest at a one and a half. Right. So I think that's one of the other key advantages of, of IAPAR at the moment is the fact that we're we're the par is kind of new and when we established the uh, the asset mix that we were looking forward and the, and the rate that we wanted to credit on the credited rate on, on the on the fund. We really took into account what was happening in the world, 
two years ago. So it was a low interest rate environment and we, we decided to be competitive with that product, but to do so, we weren't able to use the traditional 60, 40 kind of a, you know, asset mix. Yeah. So we've said, how can we, how can we be competitive, leverage some of our strength uh, and have something that's going to be, I would say, maybe stable over time. And the first thing that came to mind is let's use our alternative investment uh, that, that we, we have a, a sizable team, we've, we have experience, we have good track record. And instead of having that 60% in, in, in you know, basic bonds, well, we kind of retweak our allocation between bonds and stock by adding, let's say, if you, if you look at stocks, but we, we add some real estate, we add some private equity infrastructure. Those are kind of uh, equity-like investment vehicles, but they're not stocks per se, different correlation, different volatility. So it helps us, you know, boost the return while not really uh, increasing the risk. Then on the on the fixed income side, well, a bit more of private debt, a bit more maybe mortgages, you know, uh, uh, so private, you know, commercial lending or uh, corporate bonds too, that right now maybe what's, what's happening in the world, that's pretty short term kind of view. But I mean, uh, this, this, there's not a lot of places where you can find yield, you know? So you have to be uh, creative in, in, in how you set up your portfolio. And for us, the key was to bring the alternative asset on board. And, and one other thing that I'm kind of a, not, I, I would say proud is that we're probably the one of the first or one of the only ones that bring the uh, private equity and infrastructure into their par fund. And there's a reason why nobody wants to put that. It's the most interesting investment for an insurance company. <laughs> and they don't necessarily want to, you know, uh, split the profit with everybody. But for us, it was, it was, it was a no go. If, if we couldn't do that, we just couldn't give you a return that was, you know, sensible over time. So that's, in, that's how we manage it is we want it to be different and we want it to be true. And this is really in line with what we're trying to achieve at the, at the, at the uh, IA investment management uh, level. Yeah, I think that's one of the important things that, you know, we, we forget. And uh, we're looking at, you know, the estate bond as an example is a long-term strategy. I'm, I'm a 40-year-old person and I'm buying it for my 85th birthday, hopefully. Um, I need to have a strong company. And I think what's nice about this webinar, it's across Canada. So it's from, you know, the East Coast to the West Coast. And I think the people out West aren't necessarily as familiar with you as a company as, some of, as they are with other companies. You know, you think of the, the manualized, the sunlights, the panelized, the whoever, right? And I think that it's important to get that message out that you just illustrated in, in the last few minutes because I have to sell that security and stability to my client for 30, 40 years out. And as our, our good friend Jeff Cade always talks about, is the par product is kind of still a little bit of a black box. Like you're you're saying things there in terms of his investment portfolio and performance. But what we're interested in here, and as we go deeper dive into these products and, and portfolios of the carriers and selling that stability, the length of time you've been around and how big your company is, is lost sometimes. And I don't want to get into the history of the company, but how big is your company? What is the investment portfolio? And I know it's huge, so you go ahead and well, take it. Yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's interesting. First of all, IE has been, has been, uh, has been an insurance company for the last hundred years or so. So, I mean, if you want, if you want to talk about, you know, longevity, I think we're out there. Um, so the general fund is 45 billion, but the entire investment management is about north of 100 million, billion, sorry, billion. So 100 billion, uh, it makes us about the top 15 largest, you know, uh, investment management in Canada. Uh, the, the, we have um, more than 100 investment professional, you know, CFA chart holder. We manage all asset class within, which is, I think, a great advantage. Uh, so it, uh, we're really nimble in our ability to, you know, uh, look at customized solution and, you know, for the par, I, can, I could really go see my private equity team and say, hey, listen, guys, I need to, I need to bring some returns and I need to diversify that way. And they find, you know, they can, they, they, we're, we're really nimble. So I think uh, in terms of managing everything internally, having access to uh, outside manager too, because we have, we are one of the largest distribution platform are there. Uh, so we have access to a lot of other portfolio manager. So we're not, we're not this uh, little guy hiring to survive. I think we, we, we're a leader. And over the last uh, year, we've, uh, we've turned around a bit the culture at IE of making it more of a, a kind of a, 
a standalone, but not a standalone, but a kind of a profit looking, uh, toward, uh, toward looking, forward looking kind of thing. You know, make it this a commercial thing and how can we bring value to the customer, you know? And, and so there's a lot of, we, we hire new people, we shore up our, our, our infrastructure in terms of system. We've went uh, really hard at getting people from, from coming from large university or large, you know, pension funds. We got people coming from BlackRock, from uh, Adada, for those who know them, and, and, and for Exavis and BCI, you know, so we've, we've went out there and we got some people, you know, to leverage the already very strong expertise we have would really, you know, bring us to uh, 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 another level. And as Alain Bergeron, our new CIO, has been CIO for two years, his ambition is to be one of the best North American investment management firm. And we're doing everything, you know, towards that goal. And and, and we put money at work and we're, we're, we're out there. So we're not... I'd say, I mean, we've we've got people from New York, from San Francisco. We got guys that have a really, really strong, you know, pedigree that wanted to come to IA, probably for less money because the challenge is amazing. We're we're really at a crossroad at IA. We're at a point where we're that ship is really, you know, taking a lot of wind in the sails, and when we're moving forward. So I think it's an interesting story because we've got we were maybe a. a, a a secret for too long, and now we're really going out there. So I, I feel really good about what we're uh, we're having to offer. We're not we're not a small player. We're not just a Quebec-based, you know, kind of little portfolio manager that has a, you know, a couple of uh, ten million dollars of asset under management. No, we're 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 big guys. So uh, well, that's good to hear. Well, if your enthusiasm is any indication <laughs> of how things look, I think things look pretty good. So. I just want to take a minute to thank the team at IA. I really appreciate Ross uh, for coordinating this and putting it together for us. Martin, obviously, and Pierre. Really a pleasure to have you here today with our IDC friends. And uh, great to have you as a partner with IDC. And I look forward to some follow-up webinars, particularly Martin on the, the, Martin on the uh, our fund management and uh, seeing the secret sauce that you're going to throw out oh, there. Oh, yeah. That pivot and short up because you don't have smoothing on your side either. So you don't. No, we don't have that. We don't have 10 years of surplus and smoothing. So we really have to go at it in the first few years. And so far, I mean, we're, we're, we're doing about seven and a half percent, you know, uh, uh, per year and for the last two years. So I think we're, we're just, we're really comfortable with the solution we put in place. We really believe in the fact that it's going to be sustainable over time versus a lot of our peers. So time will tell. Uh, Ross, any final words? No, I'll just second say thank you for uh, setting this up. And uh, I will, yes, the presentations will be made available to all attendees. So I'll make sure, and the materials I had promised as well. And as I said earlier at the beginning, some people may have missed it. We're going to be, uh, we have recorded it. We will be putting it up on WinBig and we will shore up the additional information with follow up on the PAR fund and the IFAs. Uh, the one thing that we didn't mention today, obviously, in the investment side is the IPP. And one of the things that's unique at IA is you actually provide your own IPP and manage that IPP, correct? Yeah, so we do offer IPPs through a separate distribution channel. Yeah. There's not a ton of crossover, but you could have multiple solutions with the same carrier across different channels. So, yep. Well, we'll follow that up. One of our, I'll tell my Jason Payne in charge of our investment guys to uh, put together one of those because... I've done a few of those myself, and it's an interesting topic and a great opportunity for people to get surplus out of their company and for in their into their uh, hold, out of their holding company into their hands at retirement. So, uh, and Pierre can come on board and explain the taxation of that baby when we do it. So. <laughs> All right, thanks yeah, very much, guys. Have a great good. day. Thanks for your help. Bye. Bye.